Next, let me welcome uh, Martin Pravenberg. He is the Vice President of Engineering at Relational AI, and he's here to give the sponsor talk um, of Relational AI. Welcome, Martin. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, all right, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody is having a fantastic conference. I'm certainly enjoying like the bread of material that's being presented here. It's all super, super interesting. Um, so yeah, so in, in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna briefly highlight what we do so that you have some background on what we're building as a product. And then I'll dive into how we're using Julia uh, and what we're contributing to Julia in our product, yeah? All right, so first, um, so with Relation AI is building uh, the next generation database system for intelligent data apps based on relational knowledge graphs. It's kind of a mouthful, so I will explain a little bit with examples what that means exactly. But it's important to remember that at the core, we're a database system and we want to develop intelligent data apps and it is relational, yeah? So uh, I listed a few of our target workloads that we aim to support so that you kind of have an idea of what you want to do. Uh, so that is uh, reasoning. I'll show some examples, uh, graph analytics, uh, JSON, semi-structured data analytics, mathematical optimization, and relational machine learning, okay? And this is at the core built with Julia, and I will highlight exactly later uh, which parts are in Julia and how that is uh, working for us, okay? Um, all right, so to give you a quick impression of what kind of uh, things we envision to build, is like, let's, let's imagine that we are going to build an intelligent data app for flight data. Uh, so you all have used airplanes, of course, you know, there's flights, they can get delayed and there's historical information, there are busy airports and so on. So imagine that you want to do all kinds of analytics over that, where you, let's say you want to know uh, which uh, carriers have the biggest delays, or is there maybe in winter are the delays longer or at the end of the day are the delays longer. Uh, you may want to do some planning and optimization and so on. Yeah. Um, so how would you do that? Now, uh, the FAA uh, actually publishes data on uh, flight delays. Uh, and this is an example of uh, that data inside a BigQuery. And uh, while this is great that we have this data available, it is really hard to work with if you don't actually, or if you're not human, uh, and if, you're, uh, if you don't know the schema. Uh, like I pointed out some problems with this data set is that, for example, like here there's a call as flight time, and there's a number there, but it, yeah, what does the number mean? Is it minutes? Is it hours? Is it seconds? Is it something else? Um, there uh, is some uh, peculiar things, like, for example, if the flight is canceled, uh, then the flight time is zero. So now imagine that you're going to compute an aggregate over this data set, and you forgot to exclude the canceled flights, then you have some really quick flights in there that are messing up your, uh, your uh, aggregates. Yeah? So uh, generally, the quality of models is really problematic. Um, and this makes it hard to work with and write correct business logic. So what we do is that we, uh, we allow you to define better models. Um, so for example, you can very easily define that, let's say an, uh, an heliport is a subset of airports with certain properties. Uh, you can define that uh, very clearly that when a flight is canceled, you're not working with strings, let's say a string Y, and you have to guess what that means. You can very clearly define a relation of all the flights that are canceled, and then you can very clearly use those in your queries and your business logic with the write over it. Um, you can turn data into data that is units of metrics, like for example, an arrival delay uh, is uh, the maximum of the zero and the delta that we saw earlier, yeah? Um, and we're gonna say that is minutes. So now in the model, we have very precise information that this is actually a minute, yeah? And you can do stuff like, let's say, where you can work with coordinates of airports, where you can very precisely use uh, uh, the units of distance that you're working with, whether that is feet, meters, or kilometers, and you've all heard the horror stories of things going wrong when you're dealing with the wrong units, yeah? So the language that you see here is RHEL. Um, so RHEL is a declarative query language that is used by our system, and uh, that is implemented in, uh, in uh, Julia. Uh, so to show you some examples that go beyond modeling is you can add reasoning in the system as well. So for example, um, if X is located in T and T is located in Y, then you can derive a new fact that um, X is also located in Y so that you can compute transitivity. You can compute the distance between airports by using the coordinate and a distance abstraction that computes from the positions on Earth where uh, what exactly, given the Earth radius and all the units of measurements, what the distance with those airports is. That is added to your model. Like imagine that it shows up in your database, let's say it's a normal relation that you can query and you can use that directly in your business logic, yeah? Um, we also really care about data integrity. So you can, in the same language, you can define integrity constraints that protect your data from getting in a bad shape. So 
So you can, for example, say is that if you have an origin relation, then it has to be a relationship between flights and airports. Uh, you can also say that a flight has to have an origin. You can't leave from nowhere. Uh, you can say that a flight only has one origin. And for example, you can say that a canceled flight cannot have a flight duration and that a flight has to be either canceled, either diverted or arrived and not any kind of other combination of that. Okay. All right. So this is just to give you a very quick taste. I didn't explain this very well, uh, but it's just so that you have a quick idea of what we do. Okay. Now, so this is the overall architecture of our system. Uh, our system is available as a service. Um, it is deployed in, uh, uh, in the cloud. Our databases are stored in uh, durable object storage, like imagine S3, let's say. Um, and then uh, we are running all the business logic and the queries and all the data loading and all that in transient engines that we provision uh, uh, that um, use the scalable durable uh, uh, object storage. Yeah? Now, in these engines, there is a database server process, and that database server process is implemented with Julia. Okay. Uh, now, so on the client side, we also have SDKs, like just how you have, let's say, you have SDKs for Amazon Web Services or uh, for database uh, systems and all that. Um, and one of those SDKs that we have is also for Julia. And Julia to us is a tier one language where we have SDK support for. Okay. Um, all right. So I wanted to briefly highlight like how we contribute to the Julia community. So um, uh, we have quite a history with the Julia community. We've been at many uh, uh, Julia cons, like we were there in 2018. It may have been the first, I'm not entirely sure that, we, that this was the first day we were at. And uh, there's many different packages that we contribute to now. So of course we have our own Julia SDK. It's already great that we have that. Uh, but we've also open source new packages uh, that um, um, we found key in the development of our product. So there's a package called Salsa that we use for incremental computation that was presented at JuliaCon 2020. Uh, we have a package called Blobs uh, that we use for the manual layout of our data structures, our B trees in the database system that was presented at JuliaCon 2018. Uh, we have contributed to the performance of fixed point decimals. We use those directly in our database, like imagine a decimal data type in SQL. That is basically what this package is what we use for our implementation of decimals. Uh, recently, we started sponsoring the DuckDB project um, and uh, DuckDB had, now has a, a library for Julia. And DuckDB is an amazingly flexible, awesome SQL system. Um, and so uh, thanks to our contributions there, uh, uh, Julia now has an official package that is sponsored by the, that's developed by the DuckDB organization that you can use. And you can use that in data frames that is independent of our, of our product. Yeah. Um, now we've been uh, uh, hiring over the last year a variety of uh, people that are core to the Julia engineering. So some people that contribute to Julia, uh, the, the language and the system itself, and some in the packaging ecosystem. So uh, really one that many of you probably know, Jacob Quinn, uh, he now works for us and uh, he is uh, full-time working on things like improving HTTP libraries, JSON libraries, CSV libraries, error libraries, and so on. Um, there's also a package under development uh, for protocol buffers. There is already a protocol buffer package, but it is dynamic and not uh, uh, highly performant. We're developing a version that is optimized for performance uh, that we'll hope to announce that soon. Um, and we are uh, about to embark on a gRPC implementation. If you're interested in gRPC, please reach out and maybe we can collaborate on that. Now, because we use Julia in production, um, uh, with a database system, which is maybe a slightly different use case than many of you are currently doing, uh, we have all kinds of needs on monitoring and production users uh, that are kind of unique to us. And so we've also, for example, developed a, pet, a package called server metrics that allows you to instrument code bases to collect metrics very conveniently. And those metrics are then submitted to Datadog or, or uh, Prometheus. Uh, that package is open source and it was developed by one of our colleagues, Dana Wilson. Um, this year we have computed, uh, uh, we have contributed a memory allocation profiler. Uh, Nathan and Pete pre presented that earlier this week. I, I'll have it on the next slide. I'll, I'll highlight it. I will, I will go check out that, that talk. Uh, this is one of the tools that we needed to better analyze the performance of our system. And uh, we decided to help uh, make sure that uh, the Julia community can do this effectively. Uh, in Julia 1.9, there is an interactive thread pool, uh, feature upcoming um, that was developed by Kiran Palnani and various other people. Um, and um, uh, what that allows you to do is to schedule tasks that you really do not want to be compromised by long running computations. Like what the problem that we had, for example, is that in our production environment, there need to be events submitted that the process is healthy and uh, metrics need to be submitted into the system and all that. 
Um, and those tasks were not kind of scheduled appropriately. And so with the interactive threat pool, you can make sure that these are really, really happening. Yeah. Um, and we are also embarking on uh, helping out with, uh, with garbage collection performance and uh, potentially integration of MMTK. Uh, there were various talks about that this JuliaCon, and we are uh, sponsoring the MMTK project. All right, so th there, are, there are more things that we do, but these are probably the highlights. Um, yeah, so go check out uh, the memory allocator profile talk if you haven't seen it yet. It's really cool. Uh, so what it can do now is that you can uh, profile which types are being allocated, what the call stacks are. You can visualize them with pprof. Uh, it's available by default in Julia 1.8. Um, and uh, thanks also to Valentin for helping a lot with this, and Peter and Nathan from our side helped with that. Okay. Uh, all right, I want to show you a little bit about the company to show you like what is behind it. So we uh, are a 170 people company now. Uh, there are quite a lot of people in there from very various backgrounds that are very interesting. 120 of those are computer and data scientists, and 50 of those are primarily uh, writing Julia full time. Basically, that's their primary job. So we have 50 people writing Julia on a daily basis. We now have a uh, five person full time Julia engineering team. So those people are developing packages for Julia and contributing to the Julia system overall. Uh, our code base is 150,000 lines for the core product, uh, which is uh, uh, fairly concise for a database management system. So we're happy with that. And then there is about 80 code, uh, 80K uh, floating around of other uh, reusable libraries that you could potentially open source, but that we're not ready for yet in some cases. Uh, we have 100,000 lines of uh, Julia test suite code. And then in our own language, we have 32,000 lines of code. Um, so uh, our system is in production. We have an automated CI CD pipeline that compiles our Julia code into binaries and deploys that into our system. Every commit uh, triggers 27 hours of test cases. And in total, we're running 1,000 hours of builds per day, uh, of course, over multiple machines. Otherwise, that wouldn't work. Um, and in a production deployment, currently, we're executing 2,500 transactions per hour. Uh, we uh, we expect to, this to grow very quickly because our product is uh, only like uh, uh, deployed with first customers right now, and we expect this to tremendously grow over the over the next year. But it's already interesting to see that there is a live uh, Julia system uh, that is uh, processing about uh, one transaction per second in a production environment. Um, the the customers, so like I said, the product is in production. We have paying enterprise customers. I can't list them. Uh, but they're large and they have complex business logic problems typically. And we're also well funded. Uh, we have raised in total 122 million. Uh, this year we had a Series B of 75 million involving Tiger Global and others. All right, I want to briefly comment on what we see next. Um, so, like, we think it's really important to have uh, foundational packages av available for systems, like around, let's say, protobuf support, ERPC support, uh, Parquet, Arrow, Iceberg, and so on. That stuff has to work really well and be very efficient. Um, and um, uh, uh, there's already a lot of work done in there, but it, it, it can still be improved. Uh, we also, it would be great if there's more and more uh, high quality uh, SDKs available uh, for cloud providers that we would use. Um, and of course, we will continue to invest in anything that is needed for production users of Julia. Um, we're also interested in performance a lot, in particular in scale up performance. So scale up means that you use bigger machines uh, with, with more cores and la large amounts of memory. So we've observed that Julia scales very well in tight inner loops. Uh, but if, you, uh, if your application does occasionally allocate, then uh, the scale up performance could be improved. And we are engaged in trying to make sure that that gets better. Um, we're also really interested in static analysis. Like, for example, what we regularly observe is that, let's say, if you have a code path that does error handling, if there's a bug in that code path itself, uh, then you will not see your error handling. And that's a big problem. Um, and so we're really, really glad to see it yet now in 1.8. And we're planning to expand and that and maybe start contributing to it. And then we're really interested in improving Julia interoperability. Like in principle, we're a service, and it doesn't necessarily matter what the service is implemented in, which happens to be Julia. Um, but it would be really great to have also extensibility to Julia within the system. Um, and so we are looking into like how can we extend the system in some way? Uh, and currently, this is often done with Wasm and JavaScript and all that, which is due to the sandboxing capabilities that are there. All right, that was it. Um, the, uh, there's a few much more elaborate talks available online that uh, came out in the last year. If you're really interested in the technical details, I would watch the CMU talk, CMU Relation AI, uh, that dives much more into what we do. Um, and then there's some other talks available to give you more backgrounds on applications and sort of the area where we operate in.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, maybe time for one quick question. Uh, what is the thought behind having your own in-house language? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to answer. Maybe join for the panel as well that we have later. Um, but um, like we need to write very expressive business logic. It's often highly uh, recursive. So SQL is not adequate for that because of the recursive uh, needs that you have. And also like the, the it's often like we have thousands and thousands of different relations and definitions involved. So SQL is not designed for that kind of skill. Um, and we need a declarative language, so not necessarily Julia, uh, because we want to automatically parallelize and distribute and optimize that code. And like while Julia is fantastic, it's not necessarily great for that. Uh, so that's sort of the short answer. Thank you so much.